Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's Matt Bowles here from Maverick Investor Group. I want to welcome everybody to a very special event tonight. All the attendees are just uh, continuing to pour on here, but we want to start right away. Uh, we want to respect everybody's time and uh, definitely don't want to miss a minute uh, of this webinar tonight because we have with us this evening Diane Kennedy, uh, who I'm going to introduce to you in just a minute. Uh, her time uh, is extremely, extremely going to be extremely valuable to you. We want to leave as much time at the end for a live Q&A period as we can. So uh, that's why I want to start right away, um, go through some content, and then we're going to open it up, uh, and you're going to be able to interact directly with Diane and ask her your personal questions. So I hope you brought some. Uh, as a as a housekeeping uh, item here, we've got uh, on the right hand side of your panel, you've got a chat box, um, and that chat box is going to allow you to ask questions. We are going to save all of the questions until the end, uh, and then uh, we will take them at that time during the Q and A period. Uh, let me start off though, just um, so that uh, I can get a sense. How many people here? We can experiment with the chat box. How many people here? Is this your first ever Maverick Investor Group event? We have a, a private network of real estate agents uh, and folks that are able to refer and invite people uh, to these events. So if this is your first Maverick event, go ahead and uh, type that into the chat box uh, that this is your first event so that we can see and welcome all of the new people here. I recognize a bunch of the names uh, uh, on the attendee list uh, here, uh, a lot of folks that are uh, buying real estate through Maverick and doing a lot of great real estate investing. But we also want to give a very warm welcome. Okay, great. So we want to give a very warm welcome to all the new people uh, that are here with us this evening. If this is your first Maverick event, I just want to take about a minute or so uh, and uh, or two minutes and just share with you a little bit about what Maverick does and sort of the context in which we're bringing you this event. So you may have heard of Maverick Investor Group. We've been featured in a lot of the uh, media, a lot of the real estate press. <coughs> and uh, the, the short version of our business model is that we help individual real estate investors like you to buy rental properties in the best real estate markets regardless of where you live. So we enable you to buy performing turnkey real estate so that is either new or fully renovated properties. They've already got tenants in place. Uh, they've already got local property management in place so you can live wherever you want. Uh, and yet buy real estate investment properties in the best real estate markets, okay? So you don't have to be a landlord, you don't have to be a rehabber, you can be a real estate investor in the truest sense and build your wealth that way through rental properties, okay? Now, the other thing that we do, which is the context of tonight's webinar, is that we want to provide you as much value and support in your real estate investing journey as we can, okay? so. We do uh, uh, consultations with all of our clients uh, just to help you develop a portfolio building strategy for, for buying real estate to achieve your personal financial investing goals. And the other thing that we do is we introduce you to industry experts okay, uh, and advisors uh, who are niche experts in a particular space in the real estate industry who can add value to you and help you. Uh, with your real estate investing as well. And that's the context of tonight's webinar. Uh, I am super excited uh, to introduce to you a longtime uh, friend of mine, Diane Kennedy, who I have known for nine years. Uh, and uh, I, first, I first met Diane, I, well, let's see. Let me start off at the beginning. I first discovered Diane because she wrote the book Real Estate Loopholes, which was originally published in Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Advisor series. So she was Robert Kiyosaki CPA, and she wrote uh, this book in the Rich Dad Advisor series. I was reading through the whole series, and I discovered her book, and it blew me away. Uh, I, up until that moment, I literally had, I was allergic to taxes. I had an aversion to them. I didn't understand them. They made me annoyed. They made me angry. It was a, I, I must confront this once a year, and it's just awful, and I dreaded it. I read this book totally changed my perspective uh, on the concept of taxes entirely uh, and just uh, you know opened my mind up to real estate investing which I was interested in uh, and just that the tax advantage as a profit center uh, uh, of real estate investing was just absolutely incredible so I read this book and then I immediately said okay 
you know, how, how can I read more of her work? She's a multiple times New York Times bestselling author, Wall Street Journal bestselling author. She must have at least 10 or 12 books, which you can find if you go to any bookstore, go to Amazon. I read through all of them. If anybody's ever uh, uh, been to my place, uh, some of the people on the web and I have actually been to my place and they've seen my bookshelf and you'll find all of these books uh, uh, highlighted, underlined on my shelf. And... Um, you know, from there, I, I started going to, uh, I went to some of Diane's seminars, uh, and I personally paid uh, over $5,000 to go and uh, and be in attendance in person with Diane Kennedy as she was teaching, uh, worth every penny, uh, and, and has been a, a very core uh, part of my my real estate strategy has been the tax component of that strategy. So I then hired Diane as my personal CPA. Maverick Investor Group hired uh, Diane's firm to uh, to be the uh, the accounting firm for, for you know, that did the, the Maverick Investor Group company uh, tax work and so forth. So uh, we've had a very long relationship. Diane, uh, many of her clients, she deals with very elite, very wealthy real estate investors. Uh, many of them have come over and, and started buying their rental properties through Maverick Investor Group. Her staff, CPAs, uh, have come over and started buying their properties through Maverick Investor Group, and we've been, you know, providing reciprocal value to them. So uh, a, a very long relationship, but I will tell you that you are in for a real treat tonight. Diane works with a very elite group of uh, wealthy clients, and she is going tonight to pull back the curtain and share with you uh, the real estate investing strategies, uh, the tax loopholes that they use, uh, that she helps them to use. Uh, to uh, make and keep as much money as possible. So uh, with that, I, I introduce to you the, the owner and founder of U.S. Tax Aid, uh, multiple times best-selling author, and really the preeminent uh, a real estate tax strategist for the rich, Diane Kennedy. Thank you so much for being here, Diane. Oh, thank you, Matt. I love talking to your group. Um, you know, this is an exciting time for me when I get to talk about real estate. I just finished doing a three-day retreat for successful real estate investors. And I got to tell you, I, in fact, actually before we started, I was just sharing a few of the kind of aha moments I had. Well, first of all, the lowest net worth in the room was a 31-year-old who has a million dollar net worth. Um, most people were in the $4 million to $9 million range. All of them are investing in real estate. In fact, there was one guy who is a former hedge fund, and, uh, he was the one who puts together hedge funds and he also put together mortgage-backed securities. So I mean, he's the guy who's right there in the trenches when all the stuff happened with Wall Street and all of that. And after he got through all of that, and yes, he lost a lot of his wealth, but he still had a chunk of it, he was pulling, he's pulling out completely from the stock market to put everything into real estate. He says from what he knows on the inside, it's the game's kind of rigged. And the only way that he can build back where he wants to be is with real estate. And the, let's, that just segues right into this. How come the rich always use real estate either to build their wealth or to hold their wealth, or sometimes both? There's a reason. There's actually four benefits that you get from real estate. And you're only going to get this in real estate. Cash flow, appreciation, leverage, the ability for leverage, and tax breaks. Now, think about that for a minute. If you invest in paper assets like stocks or bonds, you, you're going to get maybe interest and dividends, but you know it's nothing you can control. Bonds go bad, uh, stocks don't pay dividends. I mean, if you're lucky, you might get cash flow. Um, next one, appreciation. You know that's definitely not controllable with the stocks, the stocks and bonds. That goes up minute by minute. Um, it, it, besides, what can you personally do to increase the value of your stock? You know, buy stock in a company and then go out and buy all of their products or promote it on Facebook. You know, there really isn't anything that you or I can do with stock. And that's, I mean, that's just not how stock valuation works anyway. But with real estate, there's a lot of things you can do to appreciate. Um, as long as there isn't some huge downturn that we experienced in 2008, there's definitely things you can do. I mean, you can improve a property, you can provide more services with real estate, or maybe you just start charging market rents. Plus, there's generally going to be passive appreciation over time. And depending on where your properties are, that's going to range somewhere between 2 to 5% per year. And that's using over the past 20 years, including the dip that we went through. Still, when you look at that long range, property goes up between 2 to 5%. That's higher than inflation. So holding in real estate is a smart thing. It's how the wealthy transfer wealth to the next generation. They don't do it through cash. It goes down in value. They do it through real estate. 
Um, next one on the, that I've got here on the slide is leverage. You know, leverage is relatively easy with real estate. Um, there's rules regarding who can get a loan and how much you'll pay, but the system is definitely geared toward providing leverage for real estate. Um, just as an example, we recommend for our clients who are interested in residential properties that they get their 10 uh, Fannie Freddie loans. Um, it, providing you qualify, everybody gets these 10 Freddie Fan Fannie loans. Right now, you're looking at 20% down with those, and the interest rate is a little less than 5%, 30-year fixed. That's March 2000, uh, 2015. That's pretty good. Now, after that, you, you start looking at, well, seller financing or maybe getting a commercial loan, or you start to pull money out of your other properties with maybe HELOCs or refinancing. And, of course, if there's ever seller financing, you always want to take advantage of it. But the power of leverage is definitely something you want to take advantage of. Um, I did a comparison for this real estate group when I was just comparing what is the power of real estate versus our typical paper assets. So as an example, let's say you take $1,000 and invest it every month in a pension plan and you get an average, the high average 9.4% return. At the end of 10 years, you're going to have a little over $119,000. Okay, $1,000 a month, $119,000. Now if you take that same amount and instead bought little, you know, $100,000 single family homes, 20% down, I'm going to assume a 10% gross rental based on what the, the purchase price of that is, and you've got a mortgage of 5%. At the end of 10 years, by the way, the, the idea is, is that as you build up money, you get $1,000 a month you're putting away, plus the, the, rent, the net rent you get off of those properties, take it and buy another property. If you do that for 10 years, you're going to have $20,600 of monthly cash flow and an equity of $2.7 million. I want to say that again. So if you go the stocks and bonds in your pension plan, $119,000. If you're actively investing and continuing to reinvest the money you have into real estate and not super fancy things where you've got huge appreciation, we're just looking at basic 3% appreciation. By the time you're done, you've got over $20,000 per month cash flow and equity of $2.7 million. And the cash flow you're getting is going to be mostly tax-free. Whereas that pension plan that you've got of $119,000, it's going to all be taxable as you pull it out. So, you know, what do you want? $20,000 per month and $2.7 million in equity or $119,000 you have to pay tax on? So the final advantage with real estate is tax breaks. If you have real estate, you're going to pay little to no taxes providing you're using the right strategies. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is all a big lead in on how you can make a lot of money and keep it with real estate. Um, by the way, uh, one of the things that, you know, as Matt was talking about the things that I've done with real estate, but uh, he didn't mention that my husband and I are, are actually avid real estate investors. I mean, we at one point um, had gosh, about 45 houses. We've sold them as the, pri as the prices went up, which is, wow, that was the great news. We've also owned other types of investments, commercial property, and a trailer park, which I happen to like trailer parks. But uh, by and large, our favorite things to own are the single-family homes. That's because if you want an exit strategy, you can do it quicker than anything else. I mean, you've got something you could sell to somebody to live in, or you can sell it to another investor. It just gives you a lot of flexibility. It also works really well when we're looking at taxes. So on the slide that I have right now, um, I'm talking about that the real estate taxes and how it's possible to actually have money that you that you don't have to pay tax on. Well, first of all, first one is cash flow that you get. Well, chances are you're not going to have to pay tax on that. Why? We have a phantom expense. I call it a phantom expense of depreciation. Whereas most tax deductions, you have to actually pay cash in order to get the deduction. Depreciation is just kind of like this gift, and I'm going to talk more about that in a second. But for now, just figure if you've got a property that's giving you cash flow, you're not going to have to pay tax on that. And I just, add, you know, I dare you to find any other investment that you don't have to pay tax on that you get that gives you that same benefit like real estate. Um, in the right circumstances, you can actually even create a paper loss that you can use to offset other income. And that's where a little trick called the real estate professional comes into play. And I'm going to talk more about that and how people can get into trouble by doing that the wrong way. And then it's also possible when it comes time to selling that you don't pay taxes. 
So you could do that through a pension, you could do a uh, Section 1031, or a charitable remainder trust. I'm going to go over all of these things right now in detail. So this was just kind of a little bit of overview. Let's start with the cash flow that you get when you have your property. Um, there's three types of deductions that you get, that you have with real estate. First, they're what I call direct expenses. Um, these are the expenses that are directly associated with the property. Uh, you know, it's your mortgage interest, property tax, HOA dues, insurance, utilities, advertising, property management fees, you know, other expenses that you've got directly tied to that property. If you didn't own that piece of property, you wouldn't have those expenses. That's called a direct expense. Now, if you've invested right, after you pay those direct expenses, you've got cash flow. And that's what this is all about. That's the pure cash flow that tells you what your rate of return is on this property. How much do you have left after you've paid those expenses? Uh, the next type of expenses are indirect expenses. These are ones that these are deductions that are associated with having your real estate business. And I got to say, this is the part where having real estate investments or a business is fun for me. What's deductible? Well, it depends. Just about anything can be. The IRS tells us that an expense needs to be ordinary and necessary to the production of income. That leaves the door wide open for expenses. If you travel to look at a property, well, it's a deduction. If you make sure that you keep proof that you went to go look at a property while you're gone, keep a flyer or maybe uh, somebody's cards while you're, you know, business cards where you're out looking. And of course, get a property because if you haven't purchased a property yet, you're still in that looking phase and you probably don't have deductions. So there's a huge tax advantage to acting quickly and getting a property because that's when you get to start getting the other deductions. Now the system I use with my clients to find all of these indirect expenses is to have them go through their credit card statements and bank statements for the last three months. Write down every type of expense that they see through those and then one by one we go over them to see on each one of these types of expenses, how could it be a deduction? So some common things that you might see are a home office, a, your computer, your internet service provider, cell phone, auto, travel, meals, you know, what's deductible? It depends. When you talk to your accountant, say, how can I deduct, you know, such and such expense? Instead of, can I deduct? If you say, how can I deduct? you're more likely to get an answer that gives you a possible strategy with it. If you say, can I, it's too easy to say no. So my suggestion is to always say, how can I deduct? And by the way, I used to give this talk and my teenage son, the teenage then, would hear me say that and the teenage years were harder because he used to always say, mom, can I? Instead of that, he'd say, how can I? But then again, I guess I got some chores done. So the idea is, it gets somebody thinking when you use that question. Um, by the way, also on these expenses that we're talking about, make sure you've got some kind of a record keeping system so you're tracking those expenses. You know, keep track of the, the credit card statements or your check or your debit, the, the checking account you've had a debit that you've proved that you made those expenses. That's what the IRS is going to look at. The other question then, the next one, the phantom expense, is depreciation. Now, we had the direct. And after that, we hopefully got cash flow because we want to be investing smart. So we've got cash flow that comes to us from the properties. And then the indirect expenses. Um, I recommend always taking those even if it pushes you into a loss because those are the kinds of expenses that can then be carried forward. If you can't currently use them on your tax return, it's a suspended expense that goes forward. So good idea to use those. And then finally, phantom expense, that's depreciation. Now, Depreciation has got its whole set of strategies all to itself. Stepping back, what that means is, is if you buy a property and there's land and let's say it's got a single family home on it, there's a value that's given for the land and a value for that single family home. The single family home over time gets to be depreciated. This is an expense you take on your tax return, although it doesn't cost you anything to do it. Um, if it's a residential property, you can depreciate it over 27 and a half years. Matt, you know, I'm kind of, I just finished the seminar, so I'm going to choke up here for a sec. Oh, absolutely. Well, let me check in with, uh, let me check in with folks here. Uh, how many people, 
uh, and just type in the chat box here so we can kind of check in with you. How many people is this a lot of new information? This is stuff that you haven't heard uh, uh, very much about before. Uh, it's kind of a lot. It's kind of intense. Go ahead and write new in the chat box. And for people that are familiar with what you've heard so far as a general framework, go ahead and write, uh, you know, write that you're familiar with it. And let me just, I just want to kind of check and see how many people, uh, you know, is this brand new for you hearing this stuff and how many people are, are familiar with the general framework because as we go on through the webinar, Diane's going to go deeper into these things, which, by the way, if you haven't figured it out yet, you should definitely be taking notes on this. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I just want to kind of check in and see uh, see where people are. Uh, in terms of their okay, so so it looks like we've got a bit of a a bit of a mix, Diane. For some folks, this is definitely a lot of information, and they they haven't you know heard this before. And for other folks, you know they they've kind of uh, you know they they're they're kind of familiar with uh, with some of these concepts uh, and are looking forward to you uh, uh, going deeper. So we can uh, you okay. know uh, cater to both. Great. So <laughs> and I have to stop every minute or so or every few minutes. <clears throat> And drink, drink some water. I, I, I actually was hoarse earlier today, so Matt said we'd work this together so I can still clear my voice. I'm actually going <laughs> to have to give me a second. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so, okay, so this. I'm back. I got it. <laughs> okay. All right. Yep. No, go wow. right ahead. So. You know, it's so funny. If, when you're doing a, a live event, at least for me, when I'm speaking for three, uh, three days, and you're in those air conditioned rooms, for me, my throat kind of gets going crazy. And today, this is the first day I'm actually talking. So I, I, let's get back into depreciation. So we, first, you've got the idea of where, where are you at with your cash flow. Now, the reason I, I like to first have a strategy before we jump in and just start taking depreciation of property, because you don't need to take a depreciation deduction. On the other hand, you can front end load depreciation so that you get more depreciation in a particular year. And if you haven't been front end loading it, you can do catch up depreciation. So, what is the right strategy with depreciation? The answer is it depends. If you haven't noticed that by now, that's my favorite answer. And it just depends on what's going on with your properties. If your cash flow minus a direct expense and indirect expenses still show a profit, then you definitely want to take advantage of depreciation. If there's no more profit there's, after you've taken those deductions, you might take a step back and look at whether taking depreciation now makes sense. If your adjusted gross income is less than $100,000, you can take up to $25,000 of real estate losses <clears throat> excuse me, against your other income provided you have active participation. In other words, it's not a timeshare or maybe you're a limited partner in a partnership. You're involved in some way. It's not a real high standard. You just have to be involved in the property. And that might be just simply checking in to see what's going on with the numbers. Do you have a tenant? That kind of thing. If your adjusted gross income is over 150000 you can't take any deduction unless you're a real estate professional. So those numbers, $100,000 and below, $25,000 you can take up to. If you're over 150000 you can't take any deduction unless you're a real estate professional. The amount you can deduct phases out between one hundred and one hundred and fifty thousand. and $150,000. Now, now, Diane, can you can, can you also uh, m you know you're you're talking you talked a little bit about front loading depreciation and how you can sort of structure that based on your financial situation and your goals and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I know that that part of that uh, can be a, a cost segregation where you can actually break out parts of the property that, that can be on accelerated depreciation schedules if you have like a new appliance or certain things like that. So can you just maybe uh, clarify a little bit about that, what you mean by yeah. if you wanted to front load depreciation and, and kind of how that looks? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually my next slide just says the higher your depreciation, the more your taxable income comes down. Um, the, this cost segregation study is kind of a cute little buzzword you might hear bandied about a little bit. And what it all comes down to is, let's say you buy a single family home. There is a portion of the property that's land like we talked about. There's a portion of the property that's personal property. Those are the items that are inside that, uh, pro that, inside that home that are depreciated over a shorter period of time than just the walls. So that would be your flooring, your HVAC system, um, it, even the paving on the driveway, it, ceiling fans, lights, you know, all those kinds of things that typically have maybe a five to seven year life. 
as opposed to the whole building, which is 27 and a half years. So the cost segregation study, is there's a couple of different methods you can use. The one that we typically use is where you look at the property you've just bought. Let's say you paid $100,000 for it, and 20% has to be allocated to land. Then in that remaining 80000 well, what's the value of those personal property items? So you go through and you look at this and then, hey, it's brand new carpeting. Well, okay, that's got a pretty high value. That's maybe $2,000 or $3,000. And then what's the cost of the garbage disposal? Well, it's not very good. It's about ready to go. Okay, we're just going to give it $20. I don't know how much a garbage disposal is. I'm just making stuff up. But it would be those items. What is the quality of those? And after you've listed all of that out, those are the things that you can then depreciate over the shorter life. So in an $80,000 remaining amount, there might be 20000 that we get to then front end load, take more depreciation in the beginning. Now, is this a good strategy? Maybe, maybe not. Um, let me just give you an example. I had a, a new client that came to me that was a doctor, and he'd heard me talking about cost seg segregation studies. And so he actually paid his accountant to learn how to do that. And then after he was done, they went through on his properties and did that study, went back and looked at all the properties he had, and he'd actually had the properties for a few years. So it's possible, and what he did is to go back and say, well, we should have been depreciating these items over five years. Instead, we were using that 27 and a half years. So we have a lot of unused depreciation, and then you can do catch-up depreciation. So they'd done all of that, and he'd done all this catch-up depreciation. But the problem was he'd done it when he was still working full-time as a doctor. The next year, he went to just part-time as a doctor, as a, a, a physician, and the rest of the time working in real estate. So he then was a qualified real estate professional. And I'm going to explain more about that in just a minute. But what it meant was, because he was a real estate professional, he could then take 100% of his real estate tax loss, paper loss, and show it against his other income as a doctor. He wouldn't pay any tax at all. But he did this one year too early. So by taking all of that depreciation, he just kind of sucked it all out and then created this big suspended loss that just kind of sits there. Now, it becomes harder. You can get, start using that. But it's so much easier to just kind of hold that extra depreciation there until you can use it to offset your other income. Um, you know, the, the whole concept of all of this is a little more sophisticated. The, the idea is, you can do a cost segregation study right now when you buy a property. You could do it a few years after you've owned it, and the, the, it's always the same. You're going to break out those personal property components. You're going to depreciate those over 5 to 15 years, depending on the item. And you have the ability, if you've had the property for a while, to actually go back and do the catch-up depreciation. Just My strong advice is make sure you can use that, because if you create a big paper loss that just kind of sits there, You've suspend, it's a suspended life, a loss that comes around later. So, so, Diane, would it be the case, let's say, as an alternative example to the one that you gave, let's say somebody makes $100,000 and they're allowed to take $25,000 of real estate losses against, against their earned income, right? Which is yes. a lot of money. I mean, if you, if you only yeah. had to pay tax on, on 75 grand instead of 100 grand and you're in the 28% tax bracket, that would be like $7,000 a year that stays in your pocket instead of going to the government. So, well, and not only that, but you're getting the real estate income. I mean, don't, don't forget that. You've got cash flow you don't have to pay tax on. How nice is that, you know? <laughs> I wish right. I didn't have to pay tax on the money I make as a, you know, as a CPA. Right, so you get so you get your real estate cash flow that comes into your pocket after all your expenses and the positive cash flow. You don't pay any tax on that, and then on top of that, you can start taking this phantom loss against your earned income. So if if, if somebody made a hundred thousand dollars and they they wrote off all of their cash flow, they don't have to pay any tax on that from the real estate. They might want to front load the depreciation so they could start taking that against uh, against their earned income if they make a hundred thousand dollars or less. That might be a scenario where that would be applicable for them, right? Exactly. And I mean, I have some clients that are maybe in a business where they have a big high income year and they know the next year isn't going to be as high. So that year when they dip below that 100000 is when they really want to hit that depreciation because you're absolutely right. I mean, that's significant. That's another house. That's a down payment for another house you could save. Exactly. On this. So, so the moral of the story, folks, is that you really need to do preemptive tax strategy mm -hmm planning, okay, with, with a CPA that really knows this stuff. So you can say, okay, over the next few years, this is what my, you know, if you work a regular job, this is what my salary is, this is what it's going to be. 
you know, this is if I if you want to, we're going to talk a minute in a minute about qualifying as a real estate professional. If you or your spouse wants to do that, by when you might be able to do that, and that way you can plan your whole strategy years in advance. I mean, Diane's clients have a multi-year planned out tax strategy that they're, that they're working on and that's really what the sophisticated investors do uh, in terms of really trying to maximize all these tax loopholes. You know, it, for most people the biggest expense they have is taxes and it, economist calls tax a tax drag and so when they're looking at countries they look at the tax drag because it has absolute everything to do with how much wealth the country can have well the same thing is true with your own private economy you have a tax drag if you're paying a lot of taxes you can't accumulate wealth as fast so I mean it, it makes absolute sense to do this in the end you'll have more cash you'll have more money it grows better so I, I'm a fan of it <laughs> obviously. Um, I want to talk just quickly again about those passive loss rules and add a little asterisk here too. You know, we, we've been talking about real estate and not all real estate is always the same. It, it's possible that you might have the real estate business, not the investment that we're talking about. In the case of a real estate business, I mean like you have a hotel, a motel, maybe a vacation rental, or, or you know, what's called a real estate business. In that case, in that case you're doing the thing that fixes and buying, buying property just to get the inventory. So, so for a deal, you're not going to hold it long term. People, long -term. people, people that people that most of most of them are dealing with the business are looking for investment that's going to hold long term. And so that's where passive loss rules come into play. And I talked about that just quickly. I just got it up here on the slide though. If you make under $100,000, you can have that expense of up to $25,000, and you have to have some kind of participation. Active participation is a really low standard. I mean, if you're just collecting management reports and talking to the property manager, that's perfect. Between 100 and 150 thousand dollars of your adjusted, if you have adjusted gross income, it phases out. And if you're over 150 thousand dollars, you can't take anything. And the exception to all of that is the real estate professional. Um, so, it, just kind of starting all of this, it, it, there's there's some tests. It's kind of complicated. The IRS has kind of looked askance at it. D is this worth all the trouble? I want to tell a story about a client of mine who's a cardiologist he's in Florida and he makes a lot of money. I mean he's mid six figures so he's about $400,000 a year. His wife when I first met him was a part-time nurse. So she was working because she just kind of wanted to still be doing something but they also were they had apartment buildings, they had a lot of single family homes, they had a lot of real estate that they were starting to amass and because they were buying stuff that was in poorer condition and then putting money into it. They actually had a lot of write-offs. But because of his income, because he's over that $150,000, they couldn't take any of those write-offs against their other income. Now, when we met, one of my questions are, how much does the wife like working her job? Because one strategy is to have her quit her job so that she could then spend more time doing real estate activities than any other business because that's one of the, the qualifications of this. Now she did, she liked the real estate and they started buying more properties and more, doing more of the fixing, fixing up, creating wonderful real, uh, residual income that came to them and they got huge, huge write-offs against his salary. That let them buy even more properties and within four years they were making almost as much as he did in his salary. At that point, he could work a whole lot less. So being a real estate professional frees up huge tax advantages. So it can be a great way of you know, building wealth even faster because you get those write-offs. Now, there's three tests. The first is, is that you or your spouse, if you file jointly, have to qualify. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take another break for a sec. That's okay, Diane. Um, the guys, one of the things about the real estate professional status, and I want to just kind of jump in here and emphasize this. I know uh, the audio, I think, cut out there for for about a minute while we were on the uh, right, right before we got to this slide. So just to kind of in the build up to the real estate professional, this is really, uh, you know, the holy grail, if you will, of. Uh, uh, sort of the ultimate real estate tax loophole. If you can qualify for the real estate professional status, uh, it is really you know the preeminent tax loophole. So um, think about this as Diane goes through this and she talks about what the qualifications are. Think about this in your own 
life, okay? Uh, and again, it can be either you or a spouse uh, if you're married and filing jointly, okay? So, th and think about this for years out. I mean, some people plan for years about, you know, for how either them or their spouse could potentially qualify as a real estate professional eventually and then design their real estate tax strategy accordingly. So, I would encourage you to pay very close attention to, to this section on how you can potentially do this and what the benefits are. Yeah, this is it's great. Thank you, Matt. You're doing a great job of picking it up when I have to stop and cough. <laughs> this is good. Tag team around the world. We're we're about like five thousand miles away right now. <laughs> but, okay, so on the real estate professional, you or your spouse have to get at least seven hundred and fifty hours a year, and you need to do, spend more time in real estate activities than any other trade or business. And I will tell you, hands down, this is the one thing I get the most questions up of everything I will get more questions on this real estate professional status so that's number one you're your spouse you can't combine hours it has to be one or the other there is a second test material participation and in this case you're looking for how much are you participating in those properties there's three different ways to qualify for that one is that you have 500 hours per year and I'll tell you that's a hard one if you've got single-family homes because I, I don't know, unless you're fixing it up, how do you spend 500 hours? Once they're rented, the whole thing we love is that they're just passive. Another one is that you have 100 hours and more than anyone else involved in the business. And the third one is more than any, everyone else combined and there is no particular hours. Um, right now, the IRS is really hitting it hard for people who have property managers and they're trying to make people qualify with that 500 hours. But before you completely freak out, and number one, they haven't won a court case on this. So one strategy around that is you just, when you're talking to your property manager, have them tell you, give you something in writing, how many hours they spend. Because if you can prove you spent more hours than them, you're going to win this one. Or the third test is each property has to qualify. Or you can make an election on your tax return where you ag aggregate all of your properties. Um, this is something your CPA can help you with. Uh, it, once you do that though, you just have to meet that test once. So it, it becomes much easier then. Um, that 100 hours is a whole lot easier if you've got 10 properties. It's just 10 hours per property per year. So those are the tests that have to go into that real estate professional status. A couple of things have happened. One is that the IRS had the, the instructions that they give the auditors, kind of their handbook, was wrong in the beginning. So two years ago, they were walking around and they had the hours mixed up. And so they were really having some weird audits because they weren't following the rules. Um, and then they had a couple of cases that they won. It was the cases where people were ridiculous in trying to claim the real estate professional status. You know, maybe husband and wife were both real, uh, you know, professionals where they worked a lot of hours and then they were trying to say they spent more time doing real estate than their job where they worked 80 hours a week. So that isn't going to work. Um, th the key is that you've got to be, you know, be, make sure that this looks and it passes all of the tests that you're following this. One of the things that really hangs people up is when you fill out your tax return, make sure you put down for occupation, whoever the real estate professional is, something related to real estate. I mean, you don't want to put down one, one person's an engineer and the other's a lawyer and then try to claim real estate professional status. So make sure you're doing that. Um, this is a, you know, I've kind of gone through this fast and I have a feeling we might get questions on this later because like I said, this is the thing that most people have confusion about. What qualifies, how to qualify, and then how do I report this so I have you know, make sure I can pass the muster with the IRS. Um, anything on that, Matt? Do you think you want me to go over that anymore? Well, maybe, and maybe just maybe you could just give an example. You know, for people that are building up. Uh, multiple property portfolios. I mean, let's say if somebody has 10 properties, okay, and they want to qualify as a real estate professional, in terms of these different hours, uh, you know, and the different material participation tests, what would be the, the, the strategy that somebody who owns 10 properties could use to qualify and, and how would they need to document that? Right, okay. So um, let's say that we've got, uh, I'll just use the example, we've got a husband and wife and one of them, um, let's make the wife works and the husband is going to be the real estate professional. Or maybe he's a real estate agent. Or maybe he's a contractor. These are all things that are involved in the real estate trades. So if you're doing that um, anyway, you, you then 
are considered a real estate professional as long as you have 750 hours and more than any other trade or business. Now, the, the te second test is with 10 properties, we're looking at, well, we've got to have material participation. And maybe these are all properties that you've bought in different places around the country and you've just got a nice passive cash flow that comes through, so you're not as involved. Well, I would, what I would do is make that aggregation election and then for your material participation, you'll be reviewing reports with your property manager, maybe getting in a plane once a year and going out and taking a look at it. And by the way, that's all a write-off then. And you're looking at the properties and making sure things are, up to, you know, things are doing well. I would also, uh, when you have new tenants come in, review the tenant applications. That's definitely something that can add up hours and shows that you're participating in with the properties. So it, the key is to make sure you're documenting all of this. Uh, you could do this just through a journal or if you've got, like I have a Mac and I have a calendar application on that where I just keep track of what I'm doing every day. It goes back for years. Those are the kinds of things that the IRS will want to see that they've got proof that you're really doing this. Awesome. Thanks. Yep. Um, well, let's throw a whole other one. We could do a whole talk. We could do a whole day on this one. Uh, another strategy I'm seeing a lot of people moving to is investing with their pensions. I mean, we've been doing this, talking about this for a long time, but I think there's people that are, okay, now I've got to get serious about my pension. I can invest it in stocks, and we know that doesn't seem to be, the game is rigged, so I'm going to invest in real estate. How do you do it? Well, there's a few rules that you, that you need to follow. Um, it can't be, you can't deal with yourself, for example. There's disqualified persons. You, you can't buy a property from your pension or your pension can't buy it from you. You can't buy a house that you move into for the pension. But to buy like one of the single family homes, like you have, Matt, with your pension, that can be just a brilliant strategy. Um, another idea is to form a partnership with your LLC, with your, uh, form an, in other words, an LLC, with your pension. Um, by doing that ahead of time, you set that up before you buy the property. If anything ever happens that you need to put some more money in the property, you know, the, there's a hurricane, the wind blows off, and you haven't got the insurance yet, so you need to get that fixed or whatever. That, that's pretty dramatic. But if you have something you need to put money in and the pension doesn't nef necessarily have the money, by doing that, it gives you kind of a relief valve for down the line. Right. I've got a copy of a book that I wrote called Tax-Free Real Estate Investments. You can find it at my website, US Tax Aid. But it's, it's got those kinds of rules in there. Um, I'm going to add in one other little caveat here. If you do investing with your pension, usually uh, you, people do that with cash. It is possible to get loans. Sometimes the rates are higher and they're maybe only 50% loan to value. And if you've done this through a, a SEP, for example, a SEP IRA or a rollover IRA, you can run into another tax. It's called unrelated business income tax. And the way that works is if you've used a loan on a property inside of an IRA, you can get some extra tax as a result of this. If you run into this, uh, the, uh, just I want you to just keep a note. Don't worry about how much tax it is or whatever. But a, a way, another way around that is instead to use a solo 401k. That that extra tax only applies if you've got an IRA or a SEP. If you've got a solo 401k, you don't have that tax. Like I said, we could go on for hours on this subject. I just wanted to hit it quickly so that you're aware you can buy real estate inside of your pension plan. I don't think people still understand that that's possible and actually used quite a bit. And um, let me, Dan, yeah. let me just, I'll just mention yeah. this too. We actually recently did an entire webinar with oh, one yeah. of the leading providers of self-directed IRAs and 401ks. And so for folks that didn't see that, that is on our resource page. If you go to maverickinvestorgroup.com and just click on the resource tab, you're going to, you'll be able to watch an entire webinar exactly on this topic, which goes much deeper into the solo yeah. 401k and some of these other strategies, but I would highly recommend this book you see on the screen. Uh, I remember as soon as that book came out, I got it right when it came out, and that was that. That is the most thorough and comprehensive book that I have read on the subject. So, in addition to checking out the webinar, I would definitely recommend grabbing this book as well. Oh, thank you. No, I definitely go and listen to the webinar. I, I like I said, I'm and even the webinar is hitting the surface because there's so much information here. I'm going to throw out one other thing that um, a lot of people are, in these days, we need to be concerned about asset protection. Things inside your pension are about as secure as they can. In fact, if you, you can even go bankrupt and they can't touch the assets inside of a pension. So that's another reason why I see a lot of people using pensions to hold property. It's kind of bulletproof um, as long as you're setting up and using those correctly. So I'm a huge advocate of that. 
Um, I want to just throw, I'm right now just kind of throwing some concepts out. One of the things we talked about is how you can get your cash flow from your property and not pay tax, and how you can get cash flow from your property and actually create a paper loss to offset it. Well, what do you do when you sell it? How, what, do you have to pay tax on that? Well, the, one of the most common ways of getting, you know, not paying tax right now is by using a like kind exchange, also known as a Starker exchange, or a 1031. Um, recently, I had a couple of people that came to me and said, this, two different people said the same thing within a month. Hey, we, I've heard about this 1031 exchange. Can you tell me more? I closed on my house just a month ago, and I've just got the money sitting in my bank. <laughs> you know what the answer to that is, Matt? Can they do a 1031? What's the answer? No, you can't do it because they touched the money. So that's why I want to talk about this. Just if you're going to do a sale and you don't, um, you've got a bunch of gain and you don't want to have to pay tax right now, you've got another deal you're ready to roll into, set this all up ahead of time. Do you, have you done any videos on just the, uh, the webinars on the Starker Exchange? We haven't yet, but it's a topic that people have been asking about, yeah. and it's definitely going to come up because we also have a lot of clients that are doing them. And, guys, let me just emphasize what Diane said. Plan way in advance. Yeah. Make sure you're using a qualified intermediary or an accommodator, as they're, as they're called. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can't. You got to be very careful and extremely compliant uh, to make sure you execute it properly. So, so get the the professionals that you need to get and consult with them way in advance of doing it, so that you make sure you do it properly. Right, because you end up the the benefit of all of this is that you end up with that 1031 exchange. You roll the money, oh, you roll the money, you roll your basis over into the next property. You're not paying tax now, but it's tax deferred. If down the line you sell this other property, you will have to pay some tax. But it allows you to right now not have to pay tax and roll into a better situation. Basic rules: when you when you've closed, you need to within 45 days provide a list of three properties that you might want to roll it into. Um, within 180 days you need to close on another property and all of the cash and then the sales price have to roll into the next deal. So if you sell a property for $500,000 you need to buy something at $500,000 or more or you're going to pay some tax, not all tax, but you will pay some. And then any cash that you receive has to roll into the next deal as well. Some advanced strategies and things to think about you can sell a number of properties and have them all roll into one big deal, or you can sell one big deal and have it roll into a whole bunch of little deals. You can do a reverse darker where you pick up a property first that you want to, when you sell your other one, you're going to roll like backwards into. So you can get really clever with these, but you've got to plan it ahead. Um, use an accommodator, get somebody who's qualified to help you with that. You make sure you have a plan before you close, and then again, don't let the ca cash touch your hands. Because once you've and, got it, the deal's over. And Diane, my understanding is, I mean, in terms of the big picture strategy here, is that people can, when they're ready to sell, they can do the 1031 exchange into their next property, and they indefinitely defer paying the tax on that. They indefinitely defer recapturing the depreciation on that. But then they can continue to do that. And people that have a really long-term plan, they, they, they continue to do like-kind exchanges until death. And right. then when you die, uh, then your heirs who inherit the property, if I understand correctly, get uh, they don't have to pay the tax on it, and they just get the new uh, uh, basis based on the market value. Is that right? That's exactly right. It's, they get the stepped-up basis. Um, there's one other slide I'm going to show you because it's another strategy besides dying. You know, and I'm always for strategies that don't involve dying. <laughs> that is pretty <laughs> morbid, but it's you know. <laughs> Um, it's something called a charitable remainder trust. And I've uh, worked with clients, a couple of uh, clients on this. Usually it works with people that are a little older that have done exactly what Matt's talking about. They've been rolling forward and now they've got properties, they've got this really low basis because they've been doing the 1031 exchanges. Now what? You know, they've still got some life in them. They're not planning to die and you know, give the stepped up basis. So what you can do is you set up a trust and a charity is the eventual heir. Now, the trust buys life insurance, so you're not disinheriting your heirs, but then you can sell whatever this highly appreciated asset is, and you don't pay tax because the eventual owner is going to be the charity. And then that can be invested in whatever that creates income. You can have the, the whole, all the income off of that trust until your death, and then the life insurance kicks, up, kicks in, and it gives your heirs a, a gift. And plus, you've got a huge charitable donation that you get to write off. 
So this is a little more sophisticated plan. This works really well with people that have got a charity they really care about. They've got this highly appreciated property, and they're kind of done with real estate. They're, you know, they've got their money, and they don't care if they only get five percent in their bonds because they've got ten million dollars. You know, so that this is a great strategy for those guys. So the as we talk through this, we talked a number of times about make sure you know what your strategy is. Uh, the steps for that is where are you now? You know, have a good idea of what are your assets and what kind of return you're getting on those. What, what assets do you have that really aren't assets, they're just kind of sitting there and not turning off any cash? And from that, where do you want to be? What is it you want to build? Do you want to have, like that example I used at the beginning, $20,000 a month of cash flow from your real estate, and by the way, not paying any tax on it. If that's what you want, what's your strategy to get there? And then once you have that identified, you need to make sure you're using implementation that's legal, that you're following the rules on that, you've got experts with you, and then you file your tax return so you're in compliance with all the rules. It really is simple. I see people sometimes think that they have to cheat in order to pay less tax. No, you just need to buy a bunch of real estate, and then you won't pay tax. It really is, can be that simple. Um, did you... I'm going to go, what, is now a good time to do the offer here? Absolutely, yeah, okay. go right ahead. Okay, so here's the offer. Um, you'll see a link at the very bottom, ustaxaid.com slash beat the IRS. When you go there, um, I'm going to ask you for your email address, and let me first of all give you the disclaimer. As of today, March 24th, the book is not done yet, but it will be within two weeks, and when it is, you're going to get a 50-page guide that is step by step on how to beat an IRS audit if you have real estate. So I talked to you about the real estate professional status, some of the things the IRS was trying to prove. Well, I'll give you the arguments that work. Um, one of the things that I can tell you, and it's knock on wood right now, but I have never lost an IRS audit. That you know, and I've been doing this for a lot of years. How? Because we're strategic in what we do. One of the things is, is that we have copies of all of those audit handbooks. So we know what questions the IRS is going to ask. And this guidebook t walks you through that. So it's free, and it's only for Maverick clients. Anybody else has to pay 47 bucks. So go to ustaxaid.com slash beat the IRS, and you can get your copy. And, oh, go, oops. No, I was going to say, awesome. We appreciate you uh, you offering that, folks. And I would definitely encourage you to jump on. This is brand new. It's not even out yet. It's probably going to take two weeks for you to get it if you're if you're watching this live. But if you're watching it on recording, you can, uh, uh, you know, maybe you go there and it'll be available uh, depending on when you watch it. But uh, definitely grab that uh, for free, and we appreciate you offering that to us, Diane. And and now uh, what we'd like to do is open up the floor for you guys to ask your questions. Now, um, if you can type in the full question. I see a number of people kind of typing sort of phrases or things. Uh, the important thing when asking questions is to be pretty specific and pretty clear about exactly what you're asking. A lot of times just sort of entering phrases uh, and things like that is not going to be uh, exceptionally clear. And you've got Diane here who uh, can give you some pretty detailed and sophisticated answers in many cases. So um, so go ahead and uh, type in your questions and uh, we'll take them out. We've, she's, she doesn't have a lot of time here tonight, but she's uh, wanted to make time for Q&A and I can tell you that the most valuable part of this webinar is certainly going to be uh, you know your ability to ask your personal questions to Diane and uh, uh, get your answers and if you have any clarification questions about uh, what you saw in the webinar um, you know or that kind of stuff how you can potentially apply some of it you know feel free to uh, uh, enter those into the chat box now and we will uh, we will read them out so um, okay so let me try to start kind of from the beginning here um, so I'm just going to start here. This is a general question, Diane. It says, I, I sell real estate, and my condo will close this week after owning it for 16 years. What is my best strategy? Okay, so if you've owned the condo for 16 years, you've probably depreciated quite a bit of that. Um, in other words, you're going to, I'm guessing you've got a gain, and you've also got some recaptured depreciation. Um, my question is, what do you plan to do with the money? Is it too late to do a 1031 if you want to roll it into something else or you know what is your goal with it moving forward you know sometimes buying a, a, a bunch of real estate so you can offset right now with that I, I guess that's kind of a general question I'd have to have an idea of how much gain there was and how much other income they had right okay um, uh, that's uh, the that question is from Mark I this may be a follow-up he's asking if uh, 
if he's exempt up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So that may oh, be a primary. Oh. That may be oh, a primary. I didn't even ask that question. Okay, if he's single. Um, you can take a dedu and you've lived in your house for two of the previous five years, which if this is a condo you've lived in for 16 years, then definitely that qualifies. As single, you can have up to $250,000 of capital gains exemption. Married is $500,000. Awesome. Okay, uh, next question is, don't you need, this is from uh, Linda, don't you need to recapture the depreciation when you sell? In other words, you pay tax on the capital gain. Okay, so yes, when you sell at a gain, you'll have recaptured depreciation as part of that capital gains. So um, let me back up and say that a different way. So let's say you have a property you bought for two hundred thousand and you've depreciated at fifty thousand dollars. You sell it for three hundred thousand. So you would have fifty thousand dollars of depreciation to recapture. The maximum amount on that is twenty five thousand dollars. So there is a benefit on that if you've Taking that depreciation against your other income, chances are it was a deduction at a higher tax bracket. The recapture is lower. So there's a little bit of arbitrage there with depreciation that when you have to pay tax back on it, it's going to be less that you pay. And then the rest is going to be capital gains. Great. Uh, okay, awesome. We got a lot of good questions coming in now, Dan. I'll do them kind of uh, a ra <laughs> kind of okay. rapid fire. You, you just kind of sure. let me give me a give me a gauge okay. when you start getting ready to uh, take off here. But I, I think okay. we got. Some Coming in, um, okay. Uh, do you okay? We actually, I, I may be able to group a couple of these together okay. here. Uh, uh, let me add, throw a couple of them out. One is, do you recommend hiring a CPA to do your taxes rather than doing it yourself? And then uh, we have another question that I'm going to just throw in here. Pam is asking, is Diane taking new clients? Diane is taking new clients, and you can reach me through USTaxAid.com. Oh, in fact, there's a phone number there on the uh, the screen. Um, so give us a call. The, do I recommend you do your taxes yourself? Um, I will, you know, uh, you're asking me because that's my business and I, of course I'm going to say no, I should do them. But honestly, if you don't have real estate, if you've got a W-2 job and that's kind of all you've got going on, yeah, I think that yes, you can do your own tax return. Uh, if you've got real estate and you're using depreciation as a strategy, if you want to be a real estate professional, uh, I recommend you get somebody who understands those items help you with your tax preparation because it can I, get complicated. I cannot agree enough guys and listen here's the important thing when you're hiring a CPA you need to hire a CPA that understands these issues. Most of the time CPAs either specialize in doing W-2 uh, you know tax returns for W-2 wage earners or they specialize in you know real estate investors, business owners, that kind of stuff. So you don't want to go to a W-2 uh, you know uh, accountant if you're looking for specialty in these types of real estate investment loopholes and so forth. So just make sure you're hiring the right type of CPA and that you interview them to make sure that they know uh, how to do all the stuff you need them to do. Um, Next question, can, I, can you do a 1031 on land sales if I bought the land at six months ago and am in escrow to sell another piece right now? Uh, yes, you can do 1031 on land. Um, it's very interesting in real estate. Sometimes people get confused and say, hey, I sold a single family home and I want to get an apartment so I can't 1031. No, that's not true. You absolutely can 1031. You can use land, apartments, commercial buildings, single families. All of that it can be 1031. Okay. The next question. I have 21 multifamily units which I manage myself 100%. This is Sean's uh, question. Uh, 21 multifamily units I have which I manage myself 100%. What is the best way for me to keep track of my time to prove real estate professional uh, uh, in parentheses no other employment? Boy, I think, first of all, I think that um, I'm, you're going to be easy to prove, but I think you still do need to keep track of it. I mean, I personally just keep a calendar. So I know, just like you would check in with a timesheet or something, what are you doing? It, it have those records available. It's going to be a little easier for Sean because he doesn't have another job. So, and then he has enough property that he's managing himself that, hey, if I'm not doing it, who is? But I still would like to see a journal of his time. Great. Okay, Srinivasa asks, uh, what's the advantage of a family trust over an LLC when structuring an entity for real estate investment? Okay, a family trust, I'm guessing, is like a living trust. Sometimes people use terms, and I'm not always sure that we're talking about the same thing, but I'm going to assume it's a revocable trust. Um, if that's the case, if it's like a living trust, then that's something we use to avoid probate when somebody dies. I, I absolutely think that's a great thing to use, but it's completely different than an LLC. An LLC gives you um, asset protection. The living trust or the, the family trust is used when somebody passes. 
Okay. Tiffany asks, I have two rental properties. Uh, where on my tax form Schedule E would I deduct expenses for computer, cell phone, home office, etc.? Yeah, a couple of ways. With two properties, I probably would just divide it in two so that the computer would show up half on one and half on the other. And that just goes in your other expenses. As you get more properties, usually by five, it starts to get a little complicated. And so a lot of times people will just run all of their expenses in one spot. For is, That's just all your home office that goes for all those properties. And it's just one more of those items in the Schedule E. Awesome. Vijay is asking, what's the best entity structure for a Canadian real estate investors in who are buying U.S. real estate? Oh, man. Canadian buying in the U.S. Um, everybody who's in the U.S., just put your fingers in your ears because I'm going to give him different information than I give you. Um, Canadian, The Canadian-U.S. tax treaty, you would think that the two countries hated each other because it kind of sucks for Canadians. You need to be a limited partnership. Otherwise, Canada does not recognize LLC and L U.S. LLC like a regular flow-through entity, and they're going to tax it like a corporation. So you get stuck with double taxation. So for Canadians um, investing in the U.S., you need a limited partnership, which means um, it's a little more complicated to set up, it's more complicated to run, and it's more expensive, unfortunately. All right. Brian asks, what is the best way to pass real estate onto your heirs? Uh, um, it, it, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, with an estate plan is the simple answer, but usually people start thinking about they're putting properties in LLCs and they start gifting out pieces of those to their kids, um, maybe while they're still alive, or if the idea is is that they want to pass it all upon their death, then all the kids get a stepped-up basis. It kind of depends on how much the estate is and how much they want their kids involved while they're still alive. Okay. Uh uh, Michelle asks, does a real estate license qualify me as a real estate professional? It's a good step forward, but you still have to meet all those other things. You'll have to have 750 hours or more, and you need to do more in real estate than anywhere else. But that definitely is a real estate activity that would qualify. Okay, that's great. And that's really important because we have a lot of people, real estate agents and brokers and, and yep. stuff like that in our community. So that's uh, you guys have a big, big advantage uh, starting big off here. Try to meet that qualification. Um, uh, Kelly asks, "What is your opinion of buying real estate with cash as opposed to loans?" Ah, that's a good question. Um, I, and I actually ran into this at this big three-day event I just did. Um, it, when you've got the, the lever, you lose the leverage when you're buying um, without loans. It, the, right now, money is cheap. My personal opinion is, use the money. It's less than five percent. You can get um, with the the appreciation that you've got and you know assuming you're investing so that you've got a higher than 5% return then it makes sense to use that now at the same time I want to keep cash in the reserve so that if all your renters move out you still can make the payments but I am not a huge fan of buying property just for cash it also makes it a huge target if somebody's going to sue you there's you know a lot of equity there so you need to make sure you've got an LLC around that if you happen to have big equity Okay, uh, Diana asks, um, I'm selling my, I think this means rental property for a gain, uh, I'm selling my rental property for a gain of about $100,000 and closing next week, but my adjusted gross income is $96,000 a year. Uh, what's the best strategy for me? Um, well, first of all, congratulations on selling that. Um, if you've got other properties, this is going to kick your adjusted gross income up so you won't be able to take other deductions. That's, that's something just to be aware of. So if, if it's your only property, it's not a big deal. But if you've got other properties, um, just be aware that you won't be able to take other losses unless your job happens to be something that's real estate professional. Uh, with the $100,000 uh, $100, gain, uh, I guess my question is, what are you going to do with that money? Are you going to invest it in other properties? Um, is does it make sense to you know do that so you can pick up more depreciation? What, where are you going with that? Or maybe do some pensions. I, I would be looking at what can you do to offset that gain. Okay, uh, Michael asks, does an appraiser qualify as a real estate professional? If you are an appraiser, you know. Now that I say that, no. I think we recently. I, I, I'm going to say I'm 80% sure, not quite 100, that the appraiser doesn't because I think we just recently got something from the IRS on that that did not allow appraisers doing that. Get a real estate license and do that too. Exactly, guys. That, that's, that helps a lot. 
Um, and it's a good strategy, too, to have a real estate license uh, uh, for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. uh, tax reasons can only be one of them. Yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, guys, if uh, okay, someone is saying that the site, the site is not working. Uh, the IRS. Uh, oh, it's not. It, it should. It should. It should be working, guys. Um, let's. Let's. It's ustaxaid.com forward slash beat the IRS. Um, it should be working. Uh, if anybody else wants to uh, chime in here and confirm that you were able to, uh, I got it. Uh, I just, I, it opened for me. Maybe everybody's hitting it at once. I just opened for me. Yeah. Okay. So, so it may just be a lot of people going there, guys. So just, just make sure you have, you're typing it in properly, uh, and it should work. I definitely, it, it's working for Diane now, so that should work. If anybody else has uh, submitted their info, you can confirm here on the chat box that it worked for you. Uh, Wayne is asking if we found any Canadian lenders in the U.S. with uh, Canadian-friendly lenders in the U.S. with rates under six percent to better leverage our properties. Wayne, the answer is absolutely not, uh, and I wish. Uh, that, <laughs> I wish that I had uh, because uh, all the Canadians are asking for that and would love that and we've we've heard all kinds of stories and 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 you know uh, legends and everything else about this I heard a London that can do it or this and that I absolutely have not found that however um, what we may have coming up uh, here is uh, some potential options for seller financing uh, on some of uh, the properties um, in, in some of the markets. Uh, we, we haven't officially uh, uh, rolled that out yet, but we've been telling the sellers that we work with who are providing the turnkey properties, wow, it would really add a lot of value to our Canadian clients and other foreign national clients, um, you know, if you'd be able to sell or finance at a, at a competitive rate. And so uh, we have people that are considering that, uh, and as soon as we do, we're certainly going to bring that to you. There are also uh, some other uh, some other lending entities uh, that are that are trying to put together competitive packages. Uh, for example, um, the uh, the uh, well, I, I won't I won't say because it's not available yet. So I don't want to give too much information. But we are actively on the forefront, working with uh, both lender uh, entities, including private lenders, as well as sellers, to try to create competitive financing options uh, and bring them to you and as soon as they're available uh, we will absolutely do that because we know that you guys a lot of you guys are looking for those um, let me okay. know when you find it I have clients looking for it too <laughs> exactly it's good there's a lot of, there's a big demand and so a lot of times when there's a demand sometimes people will strategically step in and fill it so we hope that that will happen um, okay, a clarification question. If I have a real estate license, does that uh, automatically deem you a real? Oh, sorry. Uh, does that automatically deem you a real estate pro? You said no. You have to also meet the other qualifications. So we've already answered that. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, hopefully, folks have been able to get. Oh yeah. Okay. A number of people have said the site works fine for me. The worked fine mm -hmm. for me. They got the report. All this stuff. So, uh, so we're good. All right, Diane, I, I want to respect your time. I don't want to keep you uh, any longer. I, I think we've gotten – I've tried to take at least one question from everybody that asked. Some people had multiple questions. But, guys, what I would encourage you to do is definitely grab that report for sure and definitely check out the rest of Diane's site, ustaxaid.com. She's got an awesome blog. Uh, she's got really substantive content. There's a lot of very, very cool opportunities there. Um, you know, and if you are, uh, you know, I think it was uh, uh, Pam and some other folks. If you are looking for uh, a CPA firm that deals with um, these issues and obviously that specializes in this stuff, I definitely encourage you to at least, um, you know, uh, schedule a consultation with Dan's firm and you know, chat with them about your needs and and that kind of stuff and see if it's a good fit. I mean, that's. You know, my my story is kind of is kind of crazy. Uh, how I came to work with Diane, which was that I, I, t I started in the beginning telling you that I started reading her books and I read through all of her books and all the advice is, you know, find a CPA that really knows this, that, and the other thing. So I'm taking all of these copious notes, I'm underlining, I'm highlighting all this stuff. So I have this like laundry list, pages of stuff where I have, okay, whatever CPA I hire, better know all of this stuff. So I start interviewing all of these CPAs. Most of the people don't know this stuff. I finally, in order to find people that knew all of this stuff that I wanted to make sure that they knew, that I took notes out of all of Dan's books, I had to go to unbelievably expensive CPAs that were like doing stuff for like big corporations and stuff like that. And they just charged me an arm and a leg, and I overpaid, if you can believe it. The, the mistake most people make is they underpay because they get CPAs that don't know what they're doing. I actually 
overpaid for my taxes to be done because I was hiring these crazy expensive CPAs. And then finally I was just like, you know, I, I went to Diane's seminar and I was just like, wait a minute. Why don't I just hire your firm to do my taxes? Because you know all this stuff. So, so that's how I started working with Diane, and uh, and her firm's been uh, been great with us, uh, both me personally. Uh, my business partner uses her, um, and uh, you know our company Maverick uses her her firm as well. So. Uh, definitely, you know, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, you know, it, 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 see if it's a good fit for you, for your needs and your situation. Um, and uh, if it doesn't, if it's not a good fit to to work with them as as your CPA, at least check out their site for the content because this is really, uh, you know, where I get most of my tax updates and my my substantive content on that issue. So it's uh, ustaxaid.com, and then this uh, forward slash beat the IRS uh, URL is just for the Maverick clients to get that. Uh, report for free, which uh, I would definitely encourage you to check out. So, uh, Diane, with that, I just want to thank you for being here uh, tonight and uh, spending this time with us. It's always a pleasure to have you. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it. And thank you for stepping in there when I started to lose my voice. So I appreciate it. And uh, hey, I see that we had a lot of people on the call today. I appreciate everybody taking some time out of their night to join us. Absolutely, Diane. Well, we appreciate your time as well. I want to thank everybody for uh, being here this evening, and uh, have a great night, everybody. Good night. Good night.